When Italian Jesuits entered China in the late 16th century, they brought with them an esteem for Dante's Commedia, and being missionaries, they viewed his Inferno as an efficacious means of exhorting Chinese Christians and catechists to avoid the behaviors that could endanger their souls. I'll begin my remarks on Canto 13 of the Inferno by the Florentine literatus Dante Alighieri with the 17th century Italian Jesuit literatus Giulio Eleni, whose writings on the Christian journey were imbibed by Chinese Catholics whose vision of hell was formed by Eleni's careful use of the Inferno. Eleni's Chinese children's primer published in 1642, a work in poetic rhyme, describes well uh, hell and purgatory in terms derived from the Commedia. Quote, in the center of the earth there were four great caverns. The first is called eternal suffering, hell. The second is called the prison of refinement, purgatory. The third is called the limbo of unborn children. The fourth is called the limbo of the fathers. Eleni's Catechism for Children refers to Dante's vision of hell fashioned like a funnel that reaches the earth's center. Placed beneath the city of Jerusalem, there are caverns containing the damned and suffering souls in hell, purgatory, and limbo. My point here is to underscore how pervasive Dante's vision of hell has been within the Christian missionary enterprise and thus Dante's reach into the Christian imagination has spanned the cultural landscape of the entire globe. Eleni's Chinese Primer is a powerful example of how Dante's positioned and visceralized hell conveniently exhorts Christian faithful to avoid such torments as those depicted in Canto 13. Canto 13 centers on two transgressions, one personal and one political. Here, Dante and his guide Virgil enter, in, enter into a tangled wood, quote, unmarked by any sign of path or road. The foliage was not green, but dingy black, not smooth, the branches but entwined and gnarled. Attending, or rather tormenting, these apparent trees is a throng of, quote, loathsome harpies, rapacious beasts with heads of women and bodies of malicious clawed birds of prey. Dante borrows here from Book Three of Virgil's Aeneid, wherein the Trojan refugees under Aeneas's command are enshrouded by black clouds and deposited at Strophades, the island where the harpies uh, live and who attack them and place a curse upon them. His literary debt to Virgil in this canto is large, for just before Aeneas arrives at the island of the harpies, he had torn at the roots and branches of a tree from which dark blood emerged and soaked the ground and the bark. The tree spoke to Aeneas, revealing himself, or revealing itself rather, to be the spirit of the treacherously murdered Polydorus, son of Priam. In Canto 13, Dante depicts the gnarled trees as the captive souls of those who have committed suicide and the harpies as those who eternally punish those souls by eating their leaves after they are transformed into trees. Having rejected their bodies on earth through suicide, Dante allegorically describes the souls of those who have killed themselves as eternally unable to assume human form. Their punishment is to be made into twisted trunks and when Dante tears a branch from a thorn tree, it releases blood and wails, quote, Why do you mangle me? Have you no sort of pity in your soul? Like Virgil's Polydorus, this tree soul in hell, quote, issued forth both words and blood together, and informs Virgil and Dante why he had committed suicide, for which it now suffers anguish in the inferno. The punishment described in Inferno's Canto 13 is for those who knew better than to commit suicide, but were unable to apprehend its danger until the deed was tragically accomplished. As Thomas Hobbes wrote in his 1688 treatise Leviathan, quote, Hell is truth seen too late. After hearing first from this tree spirit, 
Virgil directs Dante's attention to another bush spirit who was, quote, through its bleeding wounds, uttering anguished cries. Dante's attention to Florence's unremitting political infighting is illustrated in the account provided by the suffering Bush, who recounts that, quote, I once lived in that city which exchanged its earlier patron for the Baptist. When Florence was Christianized, it deserted its old god, Mars, who it replaced with John the Baptist as its new patron. Mars, being the god of war, was thus aggrieved and plagued the city to constant squabbling and civil strife. As Dante puts it in his canto, Mars, quote, with his arts of war will make her grieve. After noting the punishment of those who commit bodily suicide, Dante suggests a kind of civic suicide committed by his beloved Florence. Even the American writer Henry James recognized why Dante's love for Florence was attenuated by the city's history of conflict. James wrote that, quote, everything about Florence seems to be colored with a mild violet like diluted wine. I'll end here where I began, the connection of Dante's Commedia to China. I'm a scholar of China's history, not Italy's, so it makes sense that I should seek this connection. While Dante's Inferno did indeed reach China through the writings of Jesuit missionaries such as Giulio Eleni, nowhere in the Commedia is China mentioned directly. Now, China was known in Dante's Italy as Cathay, and during his life, China was under the yoke of the Mongols, who then ruled what was referred to as the Tartar Empire. Only four cantos after Canto 13, Dante mentions Gerione, a winged monster that, as it is described in the Inferno, has a, quote, back and breast and both scaly his sides were patterned with a mass of coils and bucklers. This patterned beast, Dante notes, was so rich and varied in its color and design that, quote, neither Turk nor Tartar ever made such cloth. The word Tartar almost certainly meant China because it was the Chinese, not the ruling Mongols, who produced the brocades introduced to Italy and mentioned in the Inferno. While Dante's vision of hell was imported into China by Jesuit missionaries, colorful silk cloth was entering the markets of Florence and appears in the imagined hell of the Commedia. While hell is not beautiful, Dante's poetic description of hell and the didactic force of his pen is beautiful, just as the Chinese silk brocades that adorned the market tables of Italy were beautiful. And as Dante himself exclaims, beauty awakens the soul to act. The Inferno was not merely a work of literature created for scholarly di dissection, but more importantly, it is a work that has served to both enrich and exhort human minds and souls, both in the East and the West. Oh,